What draws us to watch recreations of brutal events, such as battles? I went to the Guilford Courthouse National Military Park this past weekend. It's the spot in North Carolina where Nathaniel Green, that's him, led the American army against the British on March 15, 1781. For years, the Guilford Battleground Company has reenacted the battle annually, with those participating living a bit like soldiers did back then. While some of them camped on the national park grounds themselves, the actual reenacted battle is held in the neighboring city park, and the audience stands behind the American lines, with the British advancing on our position. That gives the narrator of the reenactment a chance to say this. I want you to think about the fact that a couple of years ago you were a shopkeeper, you were a farmer, you were a shoemaker, and now you've got some of the best professional soldiers on the planet coming at you. I wonder how many of you would still be standing here. And the National Military Park has laws and regulations to help visitors reflect on what happened here. Ball playing, sunbathing, kite flying, frisbee throwing, and similar recreational activities on the battlefield are not permitted in the National Military Park. Neither is discharging firearms. It's fine in the city park, though, if you have a permit. The Guilford Battlefield Company narrator talked a lot during the reenactment, but sometimes he let the action speak for itself. You can guess what's going on. They're pretending to fight. They're pretending to die. British Army is now extending their line to try and get a flank advantage. And hit, they're in for a surprise coming from the left. Here comes the cavalry. At this point in the battle, with the British under attack from two directions, Lord Cornwallis ordered his men to fire the cannon directly into the mass of soldiers and cavalry. All of them. That's dangerous to reenact, even without real cannons. Then... Both sides will disengage. percentage of the casualties took place during the actual battle. No doubt, with this reenactment, the Guilford Battleground Company met part of its mission, providing, quote, for projects that enhance the visitor experience. Certainly, this visitor's experience was enhanced. A reenactment as good as this one allows you to put yourself in the position of the soldiers. It's a powerful deterrent against going to war yourself or sending others into war. It's frightening to think of being hit by a musket ball, stabbed with a sword or bayonet, blasted by cannon fire, or doing any of that to someone else. Some children needed soothing. So did some adults. But the narrator's biggest point was this. The biggest point to make in this fight is that you had two very fine armies that met each other, well-trained, experienced, good soldiers. You also didn't have good guys and bad guys in this fight. They were all good guys. They were just fighting for different causes. Who then, if anyone, are the bad guys? And what makes them bad? While the British won the battle at Guilford Courthouse and drove off the Americans, they advanced no further. Having suffered so many casualties and needing supplies, Lord Cornwallis retreated to the coast. Seven months later at Yorktown, he surrendered the British army and the Revolutionary War was at an end. I haven't figured out for myself why I was drawn to watch this reenactment, but I was left with this question. If our forebears were willing to face some of the best professional soldiers in the world and fought for a government in which it takes two keys to start the engine of war, a key each for the executive branch and the legislative branch, 
How is it that we, the people of the United States of America, have let ourselves have wars with Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan without our Congress declaring them? Let's call it what it is, war. Now, how can we get our Congress the powers back that our revolutionary soldiers fought for?